So tonight we're going to be in the fourth chapter of the book of Sin. Verse number one of chapter four it says, Then went Boaz up to the gate. Now, this represents the courthouse. He's going that. Uh, when I saw this, uh, I reflected back on when my wife and I uh, got married. We went to Hamilton, Ohio, down to the courthouse to get licensed. And I've made people mad with this statement. Uh, I, I said, I got a license to kiss my wife. Amen. <laughs> Amen. They get offended in that because we're living in an age where they think you can just do whatever, you know. <clears throat> but uh, I've got a license, it's legal. You know, <laughs> and, and he set uh, he set him down there, and behold, the kinsman of who Boaz spake came by unto whom he said, "Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here." And he turned aside and sat down, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, "Sit ye down here," and they sat down. He was getting witnesses is what he was doing. He was going to, what he was going to do, he was going to require this fella who was the next of kin to either marry Ruth or say, I'm not going to marry her so he could. And there's a significance in that. And the significance is, is this, is that once you was lost and there was a bidding going on, there was Christ and he outbid, just like Boaz did. He outbid the devil for you. The reason you're here tonight. And ain't that a blessing? I, I'm getting excited. I'd like to take off running right now. Uh, but I, you'd have to go with me. And I won't run very far. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. Uh, you know. And uh, let's see where I'm at here. And, he's, and he said unto the kinsman, uh, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may... No, for there is none to redeem it besides thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the land of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar my own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the manner in the uh, former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning uh, changing, for, it, uh, for to confirm all things a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, buy it for thee so he drew off his shoe and Boaz said unto the elders and to all the people ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion and Milion of the hand of Naomi moreover Ruth the Moabitess the wife of Milion have I purchased to be my wife to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of the, his place ye are witness this day father in heaven i thank you lord for this opportunity to preach your word and i pray god you will breathe on it lord help us to see what we are in the lord jesus i thank you for this opportunity and i pray you will bless your word in jesus name amen now, I want to preach on this thought, the marriage of Boaz. Now, Boaz, his name means in him the Lord is strength. And Ruth, her name means beauty, vision, appearance. My first point is, I want to look at the woman he chose to marry. You know, if you're going to marry, you ought to marry somebody worth marrying. 
<laughs> I, I'm just, I don't mean I mean if you're going to get married you know and, and I'm amazed at how people look at this thing they look on getting out <laughs> they look on the way out I never did when I got married I wasn't looking on the way out I was looking on, you know I didn't plan on leaving amen if she leaves I'll leave with her amen right. so you, you know I, I got to thinking about this woman this woman Ruth that he was going to marry the first thing that I thought about was she had a past now, in her past, she belonged to another man. That's the same way with every one of us. I want to read you a scripture uh, talking about you and I and our past. Uh, in the book of Ephesians, it tells us about our past. And what we were in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, uh, the spirit that now worketh in the children of uh, disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversations in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now here's the past that she had. She belonged to someone that did not serve God she didn't serve God she was a heathen she is a Moabitist she was someone that represents the flesh and the deeds of the flesh and so here's the past that he's presenting to us today is that we've all got this past but by the marriage of getting close to Jesus you know what our past has been erased here's what happened to her when she got, got with a, 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 a Boaz you know what her past was done away with she got a bright future because she met this guy who was uh, my God is strength Amen. I'm trying to tell you today, you don't have to dwell on your past. You don't have to dwell on where you come from. You don't have to dwell on what you used to be. What are you today? If you're sitting here today, born again, trusting in the blood of Calvary, you know what you are? You're royalty. I don't care what the world says. I don't care the garbage that they spit out in front of us. You know what we are? We're royalty today. Don't let the devil, don't let the flesh try to tell you you're nothing less. If you've been born again you're in the greatest family there is there is none better brother Phil there's nothing better than being a child of God but the world tries to tell you you're missing it you're missing out on all the fun you better believe I am and praise God for it uh, she had a past she belonged to someone you know Milion his name meant sick you know what sin does it makes you sick I don't ask the drunkard this morning when he got up from his trip last night. The dope heads and all the other stuff, living it up. I've seen them come to work and they stagger in and say, I'll never do that again. They'll come in next Monday. I'll never do that again. I said, That's what you said last week. Uh, I'll never do that again. Famous last words of the person who will do it again when Friday comes. But I want to say, thank God, I don't have to do it again because my past has been erased by this relationship through the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, I thought about why, why aren't we seeing very many get saved? Well, one thing I've noticed about Ruth was she was persistent. She was persistent. You know, the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing. Now, that word cometh is very important. That means it's a process. It just keeps coming. God, you know, you know if, you, if you read chapter 1, here's what Ruth said to Naomi. Naomi done said, go back. Go back to your parents. Go back and be a, a heathen. She said, no, 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 no. I can't do that. She said, Wherever thou goest, I'll go. Even before she met Boaz, she had persistence to go where God was. Even though she didn't know she was going to run into God. Brother Ray, I didn't know that I was going to get saved. I didn't know that. I didn't know when I come from the hills of eastern Kentucky to start attending church in Middletown, Ohio. I didn't know I was going to get saved, but God did. And the only reason I got saved was because I persistently started going to church. Because 
Faith cometh by hearing. The reason why our families are getting saved, they don't come to church enough to get saved. Huh? That's the truth. You know, you can't come to church to, tonight and not come back for a month and expect to get saved. Because you need to keep hearing the Word of God. Because faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. This Bible right here is the most important thing you've got. This is more important than your suit. Amen. Uh, it don't got no zipper. Uh, my English is messed up too. Tell Jordan that. Uh, see, these people... They'll come to church and it won't be three months before they come back. And everybody says, I don't know why they won't get saved. They don't come back enough. This woman here was determined. You ain't going, she said, wherever you go, she said, wherever you die, I'll die. You know what? That was a, that was a marriage vow in itself right there. Because what, is, what do we say when we get married? Until death do us part. Uh, or until the rent comes due. Uh, persistence see if we could ever get our loved ones to keep coming back to church we could get them right with God but they won't come back uh, they'll come once and they won't come back they say well why I've got right with God if you did why don't you like church why don't you like church uh, there's got to be somebody in here saying something that you like if you don't like Brother Ray singing you ought to like somebody singing you ought to like Brother Clint singing. If you don't like Brother Doug's preaching, there ought to be somebody he comes in here you ought to like. Huh? I'm just being honest. You know, the reason they don't come back is they don't want what we got. Uh, they want to, everybody wants to go to heaven, but they don't want to go the way that God wants them to go. Mm. Now, she was persistent. But then you find the place where he found his wife. She lived in Moab. Chapter 1, verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. Boaz refers to her as Ruth the Moabitess. He found her. Not only was that, uh, Moab comes riding up and he talks to his servant and he said, whose damsel or whose girl is that? That's what that word damsel means. And he said, that's Ruth the Moabitess. You know what? You know, he found her just like God found you, wandering around out there in the world. Uh, you was wandering, but God wasn't. Uh, God ain't wandering. He knows where you're at. He knows where I, uh, I was sitting drinking coffee, and this was just a, uh, I mean, it blew my mind. There was a little sparrow. He flew down, and he sat down on the, on the sidewalk while I was drinking my coffee yesterday, and he started walking, and the Holy Ghost said, that's just a bird, but I know where he is. Uh, you know what? You're just a foster. But God knows. He knew when you were sitting over there and you was playing this religious game. He said, that boy, he's just a foster. But I know where he's at. He's out there in the world. And that's where God finds all of them. Out there in the world. Uh, he don't find none of them any place but in the world. That's all we are is in the world. Ain't it amazing? That God knows where you're at. Amen. You know, people say, well, I, I was this and I was that. And you know what God said, really? Is that what you was? I don't care what your past is. I don't care where you came from. I don't care if you was born in Africa, Asia, United States. That don't matter to God. God knows where you're at. Because it's all the same to Him. You know, Jesus came. You know what He did? He didn't come for nothing but to save you. Huh? That's, that's the place she was. But look, he said, and look in chapter number 2. In verse 5, so then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is a Moabitess damsel 
that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. Now look in verse 8. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not my daughter? Listen to this. Go not to glean in another field. Ain't that wonderful? Huh? Neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. You know what Boaz said to her? I know where you're at, and I'm going to provide every need you have. Amen. You know what, Brother Phil? Things look bad. But one thing I know, God's going to take care of us. Uh, I know it, it may not be like we've, we've had, used to having it, doing what we want to do. We're, Americans are so spoiled. They think the tribulation period has come if their third car has a flat. That's not tribulation. Uh, tribulation is when you open up the fridge and there ain't nothing in there. Right. Tribulation when you go to the cupboard and there's no food there. Uh, but God said, I'll provide. Boaz said to her, you know, if you read this whole book, uh, she, uh, uh, Naomi said, now listen, they're going to go down there and thresh wheat. He said, you go down there and when they go into the corn crib, most of y'all don't know what that is, but it's a building where they put corn. And he, she says, you mark where he lays and you go down and lay at his feet. And he woke up in the middle of the night and he said, who is this? And she said, I'm Ruth. And when she got ready to leave, she said, he said, give me your veil. And he fills her veil full of this wheat. You know what he said? She come home and, uh, and Naomi said, where in the world did you get all of that? Right. Huh? I want to tell you, where in the world did you get all the stuff you got? Stuff that you don't even use? Uh, my wife, she loves these little figurine things. Ain't nothing wrong with them. You won't go to hell for having them. They serve absolutely no purpose. No purpose. They don't talk to you. They don't walk. They don't speak. They don't do nothing. But she loves those things. Huh? Do you understand? God's let her have all that. Just stuff. A lot of us, if we could stand up here and be honest and say, we've got way more stuff than we need. Uh, uh, our, our coat hangers that, uh, are bowed down because all the clothes we got on them. Uh, we've got nicer cars. We got, we got padding on the church pews. Would you come here if you just had to stand for two hours? How good God has been to provide us with air conditioning. Uh, Y'all ain't saying much. What if the air conditioning gets cut off? Would you come? Uh, hmm. I'm just saying, God's been a good provider. Uh, he never said He'd give you everything you wanted. He'd give you everything you needed. But we've determined that we're going to have it or bust. You're just going to leave it. I'm just being honest. I'm not preaching against you having stuff. Have all you can, but don't let it have you. Because the God we're serving is a God who's big at providing. Just like Brother Christian preached on this morning about when she went back to that barrel, every time she went back, there was just enough. I want to tell you, that's what you need, just enough. You just need enough. You know why? Because we think that we're going to get up in the morning and go to work. I want to say this by the authority of God. There is no guarantee that you'll get up in the morning and go to work. Because today is the only day God's ever promised you. Huh? Y'all looking kind of sour about that one, but it's the truth. It's the truth. And you know why are you so down about it? You're only going to heaven. You ought to be saying, Lord, come quickly. Right. right, Brother Phil? Come on now. Come on now. The only reason I don't want God to come right now is because of my loved ones. That's the only reason. I've got a 19-year-old grandson who's lost without God. Uh, I, every day I wake up, I think, if the Lord comes back today, he'll go through the tribulation.
That breaks my heart to know I've talked to him about God. I've told him about God. I've took him to church. I've read him the Bible. I've sat in my office when he was little and sat with him in my lap. And I'd take the Word of God and read to him. Amen. And it breaks my heart to know that if God comes back tonight, he'll go through the tribulation. Brother, it's going to be, pardon, it's going to be hell on earth is all I can say. This tribulation, and I want to say this, everybody in here, you've got somebody, if God comes back tonight, you know what they're going to do? They're going to spend hell on earth before they go to hell. you got family. Now, let me say this. I'm not saying that I'm a judge that I know everybody's, who everybody is is saved and lost, but the Bible says by their fruits you'll know them. Huh? I know if I go, and I don't go, my wife goes, and she buys the fruit. If she brings home apples, I say, boy, those are the, not, the, those are the best tasting peaches I've ever had. You know why I know? Because I see it. I can see that apple. I'm going to tell you something. These people who have no desire to be around God's people, they got more in common with those people out there. That's because that's their people. Uh, you can put a you can put a dress you can put dress clothes on that don't change you. A dress ain't gonna make you a, a, a saved woman. Suit ain't gonna make you the mafia. I've I've watched a history about mafia. They wore suits. Wicked people in the world, huh? That ain't got nothing to do with you being saved because you wear dress clothes. You can bar bibbed overalls and go to heaven. Nod your head. Yeah, you can. You don't have. To. Yeah, you really can. I know you. <laughs> I hope I don't have to, but I have before. Now, look at this. In chapter 2, verse 2, it says, And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field, listen to this, after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz. Her marriage to him was providential. God's hand was in it. You know why you got saved? That God sent that friend to you? His hand was in it. That wouldn't. What word "hap" don't mean? It just happens. God's hand. You getting saved? God put you exactly where you needed to be to hear the message you needed to hear. Nobody else, man, not got anything out of the message you heard, but you did. Why? Because God put you there and providentially worked it out. I went to Mason, Ohio, 1977. I was 18 years old. Started going to church with my family. Had no intentions of going to church. The only reason I went is because they said they had some girls there, and I'm all for that. I, I'm not into this LGQB2, whatever it is. That ain't none of my business. Uh, I told you my favorite subject in school was recess and watching girls. Uh, so when they said there's girls at the church, I'm in. Let me go. Let's go. And after a while... The girls kind of got to where I wasn't interested because this message. Why? Because God used something that he knew an 18... And I wouldn't give you a dime for an 18-year-old boy that don't like looking at girls. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah. And I'm just... See, here's, here's, what, here's what happened. God used something that I was interested in to take me to a place that I was not interested in so he could get my attention so I could get my attention off of what I liked onto what he liked. And then one snowy night, I got saved. Providential. It was God's working. God's, he's orchestrating all this. God's sending people out. You know what he's doing that for? To save people. 
He ain't interested. Uh, these people talk about he ain't interested in sports. He ain't interested in NASCAR. He ain't interested in it. He's interested in them people. He could care less if the Reds ever wins. And I, I know y'all going to get mad. He don't care. He cares about who's pitching if they're saved or not. He sent his son to Calvary. Why? To save that pitcher. To save that catcher. To save that one who plays on the basketball team. But the basketball team don't mean nothing to him. He don't care. You know, and, and this made people mad. If Dale Hearn, Earnhardt would have been in church and stood on the racetrack, he'd be alive today. Huh? He'd still be alive today. This is the most important place in any there ain't nothing going on in there ain't nothing going on at the White House. More important than what's going on here today. Huh? Yeah. You know this? The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God has no desire that anybody should go to hell, but you know what he'll do? If you don't get born again, you will go there. Huh. Amen. Now, you know, another thing that Boaz said he would do, he would protect her. He said, you know, uh, uh, in verse 9 of chapter 2, he said, Let thine eyes be on the field that they, that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? You know what he said? He ain't, they ain't going to run you off. He said, because I done told them. You keep your hands off of her. That's my girl right there. You know what you are? You're God's children. Huh? Huh? I couldn't tell you the times that I've come this close to having serious wrecks. They, the deer are out when I go to work, and they like to stand in the middle of the road and look at you real stupid. So many times... You know what that is? That's God protecting. So many times. You'll never know. Now, let me tell you this story. My nephew, he is a, a air traffic controller in uh, uh, Orlando. Last week, they had the, uh, uh, the handicapped children. They had their little uh, thing down there where they, they were flying in. There was two airplanes coming in to, to Lando. One coming in at 120 and one coming in at 160. And my nephew told the guy that was coming in at 160, you need to make an immediate right and drop 4,000 feet. And he said, me? My nephew said, you need to drop 4,000 feet and make an immediate right. It was so serious that his boss come out from the from uh, the floor down underneath, and he said to my nephew, he "said Jeffrey, what's going on?" He said, "I'm trying to tell this guy if he don't pull up and make a right, he's going to have a catastrophe right out over our runway." There would have probably been two or three hundred people killed. You know what that was? My brother told his son. He said, "Jeffrey." God answered some mother's prayer so that you were able to keep them from colliding. Do you understand? God is protecting us every day. I'm not out here on my own. I'm under God's authority. I'm under God's protection plan. Uh, do you know the last thing? Boaz would be willing to purchase Ruth. He done told, he said, I'm going to outbid you. If you're not going to take her, I'll take her. He said, I got my eyes on her. And that's what happened, Brother Brian, the night we got saved. The old devil said, I'm not willing to go that far. And God said, I'll go all the way to Calvary. How far are you going? He said, I ain't going that far. He ain't worth that to me. He is willing to pay it with his own blood. You're sitting here tonight because God sent his son to Calvary and he was willing to go. He purchased you with his own blood. Huh? Amen. <laughs> I'm 
point number two. The way that Boaz would marry. Huh? I've already told you this. He married by going out and looking. Huh? He, there ain't a rock. He ain't unturned to save somebody. Amen. Do you know that God has martyred His children to see heathens come to know Him? You know what God's doing? Brother Christian, He's up there in heaven looking down everywhere in this world and He's looking for someone who needs to be saved. That's how He does it. He's busy out there. He's the FBI. He's searching every nook and cranny. There's not nothing, nothing, nowhere that goes on that our God is not looking around to see. He looks at your family and you say, well, I, I think they're just a little messed up. And God says, no, they're not. They're lost. You know what He says? I won't quit. I'll turn over every rock. I'll turn over every tree limb. I'll do everything. I'll kill my own children just to save some sinner. And we think that's cruel. But God knows this hell we're talking about. He knows the extremes of hell where they're going to go and burn forever and ever and ever and ever and never come out. He don't look at death like you do. You know what He says? I'll have my children home and I'll get somebody else saved. <laughs> That's a winner. Huh? That's a winner. Look, he does it by listening. You know what God's doing? He don't save those that don't make an effort. You say, well, I thought it was all God. They've got to go where this Word is. You come to church and you're lost and you listen, you know what God will say? I'll listen too. He's listening to what your heartbeat says. Huh? Are you willing to get born again? You know what Ruth said? I'm going to find this woman. I'm going to listen. He knew what kind of woman she was. He knew that she was a Moabitess, but he knew in her heart she was a good woman. Huh? She was a better woman once she met him. Huh? Ruth was. He's listening. You know, he's God's listening to these people out there. What are they saying? God, I don't need you. It's okay. Go on. They say, God, I, I need you. Come on. Huh? Well, I tell you, it's good to be saved, ain't it? Uh, he got her by looking, by listening, but by latching on to her. Huh? I remember the first time, Brother Ray, I seen Rhonda. We'll be married 43 years this year. She came to the church where I was attending. She come with her mama and her daddy. And they asked her and her mom to sing. She was wearing a white dress with a blue scarf. I don't remember the song. I wasn't listening to that. I'm not trying to be all spiritual or nothing. I'm just saying. I was 18 years old. What do you expect? Huh? Huh? I said, you know, I, I like that. You know what we've been together for? Because we've latched on to one another and ain't let go. There's been times it ain't been easy. If you've ever been married very long, you got two years, wait till you get 42. You'll have a lot of trials and tribulations. You know what you have to do? You have to hold on. You know what God said? Ain't it good? Ain't it good to be saved and to be saved forever? Hmm? I got the opportunity to, to explain to my mother-in-law and it's kind of floored me. She said, Ron, can you explain to me eternal security and I was I about passed out and I said sure enough she said where I go they believe in eternal security but they just say you believe that because that's what the church believes that's dumb that's dumb this woman needed some assurance about what she's trying to I said let me tell you this 
This thing of being born again, it ain't about works. It's about a birth. Uh, I told her, you know what, when you get... I told her, when you gave birth to my wife, I don't care what happens, she'll always be your daughter. These kids can act up, be ugly, be mean, fight amongst each other, and he'll still there ain't nothing they can do to be not be your child. You know why? Because births, births are real. You can see the evidence. Huh? I want to tell you, when you get saved, God, God gets a hold of you and He leads you all across this world. You will stumble and fall on your face a thousand, maybe a million times, but you're still His. All you'll do is get a whipping. Huh? It's always better to be good. There's less leather involved in the, if you behave yourself. <laughs> you know what? Here's another thing. When he got her, he wanted something, and she wanted something that would last. And uh, chapter 2, verse 10 said, Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? You know what? She said, I want this to last. I want to tell you, I don't care what comes. I don't care if gas gets $3, $4, $20. God's still God, and I'm still His child. Right. Huh? If it gets to where we can only have church once a week, God's still God. I'm still His child. There ain't nothing going to... This thing is going to last. Uh, you know, they say, well, you, you give you eternal life. When did that start? It's been started a long time. It's kind of like getting, uh, like getting on an escalator. You just jump on. It's moving. You just jump on and drive her to the top. That's the way it is to be saved. It's going to last. Sure Amen. We're about done. A couple, two more things. You know what he did? He chose her with love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He don't hate you. He loves you. Huh? He's standing here tonight with his arms open. If you're a child of God, he's got his arms open. If you're not a child of God, he's got his arms open. Hey, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God right now, right today. I'm his child. I don't have to wait to get to heaven to be his son. I'm his son right now. I started being his son in January of 1978. Why? Because I got into the family by birth. Amen. He loves me. And there's nothing I can do. I don't know why he does. Huh? He's the only person that can love people who ain't worth loving. He's the only person that can love people who will despitefully use him even after they get saved. Say, God, you ain't fair. I've got a flat today. My washing machine is tore up. Uh, and there's people out there, that ain't, they ain't got a washing machine. Uh, God's been good. Listen to this. Here's the last point. He picked her so they could have a life together. You know what's going to happen one of these days, Brother Rod? Yeah. <laughs> one of these days, the trumpet's going to sound. And we're going to shoot up out of here like rocket ships. We're going to meet him in the air and go on up to heaven. And we're going to be there for, I believe, seven years. And we're going to come back and we're going to be here for a thousand years. Then we're going to go back and we're going to stay there with Him. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to be surrounded. Surrounding Him. Heaven ain't going to be about you. Right. Huh? It'll be about you worshiping Him. Right. Amen. It's a life together. I don't know how long this life is. It's eternal. How you, I can't explain how, how long eternal is. It's a long time. Yeah. Huh? It's a long time. God saved you so that He could, you know, it wouldn't it be odd that you, you walk, you, you, you're, you're standing up here at the altar, the, the man that's going to be the husband, and they start playing that song, and the door's open and the bride comes down, and you go through the marriage, and you go through all the thing after the marriage, and then when you get done, you take her back to her mom and drop her off. And you say, well, I'll see you. It's good. It's been, it's been sweet. And she'd be looking at you like, boy, you're a real goober. <laughs> no. 
You, you, you spend your life together. You spend your life from here on out together. I want to say this, my friend. I, this ain't part time. This thing of being a Christian, it ain't part time. This ain't some Sunday relationship. This ain't some Wednesday night relationship. This is something when I get up in the morning and go to work and I get in that semi truck and drive all over the creation, you know what it is? God's sitting right there with me. Uh, when I get out of that truck and go home and he gets in my car and he's right there with me. It's all the time he's with me. We're going to spend life together. But I want to tell you, I'm glad I'm saved. And I hope you are. Brother Christian, you can. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.